Stanford University. So we are here now to talk about what we're calling familiar faces, new models, and how to be a journalism entrepreneur. Uh, on this panel are people who have had deep journalism backgrounds and are doing new things. Uh, we had one, uh, you'll notice if you were looking for one more panelist who is not here, Margie Freivogel, who uh, is the longtime, uh, a longtime editor at the, at the St. Uh, Louis Post-Dispatch, and now started the online local news site, the St. Louis Beacon, which is getting a lot of attention. Became a grandmother for the first time, and so we said we'd let her go. <laughs> so she isn't here. She sends her regrets. But, um, but we have a great panel They're here, and I just want to quickly introduce folks. Uh, what we're going to do is um, have them each talk four or five or six minutes about the innovative project and, and that they're working on, what, what's, their, what's their current uh, job, what do they do now, and a, and a lesson or two for all of you if they have something to, uh, to impart. And then open it up for questions. Um, so you know, it's not news that um, there's, there's layoffs, there's buyouts. News institutions, journalistic institutions, seem to be melting is the word that I've thought about in trying to describe this. Um, and that we can't really rely on big institutions surviving in the way that they have in the past and being playing the role they have in the past. But the good news is that there's a whole new group of organizations, a new, new sets of institutions, new innovations that are springing up, many of them in, uh, all, in cities across the United States and some of them are represented here. And the new models for the new journalists and the new journalism organization can be found here, can be found outside this room. Um, so let me introduce some of the folks here who each represent a different kind of model, and there are others. Um, but we have some of the, some, a couple of alums and uh, a couple of folks who are not alums on this panel. So Jerry Capici on my far right uh, runs ganglandnews.com. That is, yes, a mob website, a mob news website. He is a reporter, columnist, and author. And um, he started, he learned how to put a website together when he was a night fellow. And he might be able to tell you a little bit of that. He was uh, writing for the New York Daily News um, and then started this site as a 1994, 95 night fellow. And he's been doing it ever since. Um, one of my favorite stories about Jerry is I heard that there were some gangsters on the lam who would duck into public libraries to go log on to a site to see what their friends were doing, and maybe their enemies. <laughs> so that's Jerry. Um, my far right is, is, is also Jerry, but Jerry Megalitz, uh, who uh, many years of uh, being a photographer and photo editor, photo director at the San Jose Mercury News, uh, really doing cutting edge things at the Mercury News and decided to start her own company called Story 4, a multimedia production house. And she just started it this year. And she's creating content for websites and um, newspapers, nonprofit organizations, and others. Um, and she is one of the few people I know in who won an Emmy while she was at a newspaper. It's pretty cool. Yay. <laughs> Robert Rosenthal, on my left, is executive director of the Center for Investigative Reporting. And he's been a journalist for, for almost 40 years, worked at a lot of the biggest newspapers we all know, and many of them, you may have worked with him. Um, I did as well. Uh, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Philip Inquirer, San Francisco Chronicle. Um, and he, coming out of that experience, and has always had a, a deep interest, I know, in investigative reporting, joined the Center for Investigative Reporting as executive direct, director last year. And is you're seeing a lot of stories about the Center for Investigative Reporting now. And they have a California project. They've joined the Investigative News Network. There's a lot of um, new, exciting things going on. And they're building something really wonderful, I think. On my far right is Jose Zamora. And Jose is with the Knight Foundation. And he helps run the um, Knight Foundation's News Challenge program. And that's a program that, over the past five years, has given out $25 million. Is that right? I think about right. Uh, in, contests, in, the, in contests to fund digital news experiments to transform community 
life. And um, he's going to talk about <coughs> some of those projects and um, what that mean, might mean for journalism. So, so why don't we start with Jerry? Uh, good afternoon. As Dawn uh, mentioned, it's Jerry Capisi. Uh, and since 1966, uh, I know I'm not supposed to look that old, but that's how old, I, that's when I did start in the newspaper business. And since 1966, when I started at the New York Post, I consider myself a newspaper man. Uh, it's been about 13 years since I've worked in a newspaper, but I still consider myself a newspaper man. And like most reporters, whether you work for a newspaper or television or radio, uh, most of you at some point have covered police stories. Now, I covered cops and robbers and police and organized crime and crime stories pretty much all of the 38 years that I worked as a newspaper reporter. And invariably, I'd run into cops and agents who would want me to become friendly with them and become loyal with them and ask me for some information that I had gotten in my uh, travels as a journalist. And I would basically say, and they would you know, accuse me of not being responsible or not being loyal to them and law enforcement. And I tried to explain to them that as a newspaper reporter, I was loyal to two people or two entities. <laughs> number one was the reader, and number two was the person who paid my salary. Other than that, I was just there trying to get information from them. Um, in 2008, it's a year ago, I found myself at a bit of a crossroads and the readers became the people who were paying my salary. I mean, that developed out of necessity. Um, I've had this website, as Dawn mentioned, for 13 years. I created it when I was here at Stanford. Uh, it's had several variations, but uh, from 2002 to 2007, I was supplementing my income by, making, uh, by writing the same column for the New York Sun. They were paying me, as it turned out, $500 a week. So that was $2,000 a month that I was getting to write my column, which was also online. But in late 2007, that ended. And in 2008, I found myself having to deal with the fact that the ads were not paying the freight. It just didn't make sense. And so I was faced with the, the, the problem of either giving it all up or figuring out a way to make it work. And so we decided, uh, my wife maybe gave me a suggestion, other people said, it's, you're crazy, but it became an, uh, either you know, just do it or get off and stop doing it completely. And so I did some research. I came up with a, uh, pass, um, a program, uh, Password Protector. Uh, I did some research, I came up with this program, which told me that I could actually charge subscriptions. So I had to come up with the amount of money that I needed to make, and it was simple. I was making 2,000 a month, 500 a week, from the New York Sun. I was making it, uh, so I felt if I could sell my subscription to 500 people a month, I would make as much money as I was making then, it would be fine. I was getting 50 to 60,000 hits, hits, unique visitors a week. So those people would come every month, that would be, 50,000 people, if all I needed was 500. And that began my quest for the 500 people. Um, I did some research, I got someone who was technically astute. He helped me redesign my web page to make it a little bit more um, modern, I, I guess you would call it. And you know, to make a long story short, in June of uh, last year, we were ready to go. Uh, it had cost me a total of about $1,000 for the technical help that I got, $400 for the password protector program, and another $100 on in incidental costs that I had to uh, uh, pay to hire a, uh, an online credit card monitor. I had to do, uh, hire a few things. It cost me $1,500, uh, and then I gave the technical guy another $500 bonus. It cost me $2,000 to get my business going. Uh, what I did was on the first day that um, I announced my paid subscription website, I told all my subscribers that this was the last week they were going to get a free column. That after this, after that week, uh, they would have to pay for the column as well as the archives. On the first week, what I did was I stopped 
access to the archives. And I had a technical person explaining to me how to do this. I'm not technically astute on this, but it was explained to me how to do it, and I did it. Um, so I made the announcement. You're getting a free column. This is it. Next week, if you want, you're going to have to pay for the column. And if you want to read any of the 12 years of archives that I have, you're going to have to subscribe now. Um, I got a few subscribers within that first week. I guess people didn't believe that I was really going to go ahead with it. <laughs> the following, and in the course of the week, I got a few nasty emails. How dare you? How could you do this? Who the hell do you think you are? I mean, the Wall Street Journal does it, you too. I mean, a lot of stuff. <laughs> but I, like, like I said, it was either you do it this way or I'm stopping. I, you know. A week later is when we really went whole hog. and. I really got a lot more emails, but within the course of several weeks, I was doing much better than I had anticipated, much better than my worst fears. I had you know, surpassed the 500, and it, you know, I was doing much better. So I was making twice as much money selling my web page, selling my story each week than I was working for the New York Sun. Um, pricing became an issue to, to explain to how I, I said, you know, how much would you charge to read my column? So I looked around, and in Newsday, which is a New York paper that's still around, they were charging $2.95 to read one article. If you wanted a reprint of a previous article, it was $2.95. I said, well, how about a buck a week? So I was going to do a dollar a week. I spoke to my son, who was a little bit of an MBA. He said, no, nah, you don't want to do that. $5 a month is better. And one of the things that uh, I learned was he was right, because one of the costs that I have to pay, I pay 35 cents for every credit card fee that I, I charge. If I was charging a buck, it would be 65, it, it, wouldn't, make, it wouldn't be worthwhile. And technically, logistically, it would be too difficult. So I went with the $5 a month. I gave people a break if they logged in, for, if they were su subscribed for six months. It was $25, you got a free month. And as good as it got was nine months for, you know, a whole year for $45. That was my three months free deal. And like I said, it's been uh, pretty good. As I've done better in the last year than I was doing in the last five years when I was working for the New York Sun as a columnist. So it's been fun. Uh, it's been technically um, a little difficult. I mean, now I have to write a column every week. I can't take a vacation. <laughs> Next week. I will have, I have a guest column. It's got to the point where I'm going to pay somebody to do my column for me next week. Uh, I do that two, three times a year just to make sure that, you know, uh, people don't, that I'm not someone who does it all the time. But it's worked out pretty good. Um, I don't know if anybody here is interested in organized crime, but if you want to take a look at the site, see how it navigates, um, I've created a special uh, password for Night fellows for this weekend uh, through, and I, this is one of the logistical problems I had. I didn't know if I set it to the end on the 12th, it would end at 12 midnight on the 12th, or 12 midnight on the 13th. So I set it to expire on the 13th. So it should be available uh, through Sunday, all day Sunday. And obviously the, pa the, 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 the username for everyone would be what? Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T. And the password for everyone would be Fellow, right, exactly. <laughs> so if you, go to, if you go to my website up in the corner where it says my account, if you click that, you'll come to a page that says, you know, log in, you put in night, you'll put in fellow, and you'll come to my web page and you can scout around and do whatever you like and see how, uh, how it works. And that's my story on how I became an entrepreneur. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. We're going to go to the next Jerry, Migalitz, and talk about her new company she started. Well, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, but first, I want to say this is unsolicited that being a Knight Fellow is like going through a portal for me to another world because I never would have been able to reinvent myself and my craft without the experience I had here, which is really powerful. Good. Um, Story 4 is a multimedia production studio. We specialize in original short form documentaries for the web. Our business plan includes three areas. 
because of all the uncertainty. Currently, the core of our work is planning, gathering content, and producing videos for nonprofits and foundations. As advertising continues to migrate to web video, we believe that opportunities will increase for producing editorial pieces for news organizations, whatever form those news organizations have. A third part of the business is multimedia training for journalists and nonprofit staff. All of the partners in Story4 and contributors are active teachers. We began plans for a company in the summer of 2007 as pressures on newspapers mounted. We imagined a small company known for excellence and innovation in visual storytelling. We wanted to be the best at what we do and do what we love. We wrote a business plan complete with rows of zeros, <laughs> but we believed we were just ahead of the market demand. It was scary, but it was a fantastic place to be, to be building a solution just ahead of everybody else. As journalists, we're trained to walk all the way around a problem and see every facet, every wrinkle, and every barrier. If we're to successfully integrate our skills into a world that demands entrepreneurial thinking, we must fight the urge to dwell on obstacles and instead see possibilities and solutions. You have to immediately focus on moving forward. That requires a leap of faith, and it also it always means embracing risk. Startup guru Guy Kawasaki says successful businesses should make meaning. Story4 was born out of a passionate desire to save two things that we felt were unique. We wanted to preserve the ability of a highly creative core of collaborators to work together. That was being threatened. And number two, we wanted to continue to tell meaningful stories in multimedia to be able to innovate and to grow. It took a, a period of self-examination and a test client um, to cement our belief in story for and our business model. While we were working full-time jobs, um, we tested our model. There were other companies doing similar work in different markets on the web, but we really needed a trial. We, we did our first um, job. We had a success. We were off and running. Now our business development means working contacts, just like a great reporter, seizing the moment, just like a great photographer, and jumping in with both feet on a story, just like a great news organization. These are the exact same instincts we had honed in years of an, in, working in a newsroom, but now they're working well beyond the walls of the institution. Some of the most important lessons I've learned are first, to collaborate across skills and sectors. Story4 has diverse expertise within it. One of our key founding partners is a consultant and expert in the nonprofit and foundation sector. That's been really valuable to us when we sit down at a table with nonprofit or foundation clients to be able to speak their language. Second, learn and adjust and be prepared to do that constantly. The rate of change in business dictates that you need to be a student of the web and a student of communication trends, and these are changing daily by the minute. Third, build on your passion. Find ways to leverage your extraordinary skills that have taken you here. Fourth, have no fear. The only way to fail is to do nothing. I recommend two books designed to put you in motion on entrepreneurship. Guy Kawasaki's The Art of the Start, and Tina Selig's What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. I found these really inspirational. Story 4's creative team is grounded in documentary photojournalism and newspaper work, so leveraging still photography, audio, video, graphics, and text in a web environment drives our approach and our style. The web and its audience are shifting by the minute, and we give it our best try to try to, involve, to evolve with them. Um, it's probably best if I show rather than try to describe to you what our work looks and sounds like. So I'm going to show a short trailer we did as an introduction of a piece we just finished for the Women's Foundation of California. 
Uh, the foundation wanted to showcase the work of grassroots organizations for other funders and donors to see. <coughs> and they rolled out this video <coughs> in an email blast um, that they sent out in three short pieces over a period of four weeks. Stretching over 400 miles through the central parts of California lies the breadbasket of the world. 6.5 million people live here in the fastest growing part of the state where one quarter of the food Americans eat grows. Few people have visited the Central Valley except to speed through on Interstate 5 or Highway 99 on the way to somewhere else. There are no tourist destinations here, and as people drive through, they see only fields, fast food restaurants, and the haze produced by diesel trucks and pesticides. But there is more to the Central Valley. People from around the world are connected to this fertile and too often overlooked land. In March of 2009, the Women's Foundation of California, which has been funding leaders and organizations in the region for 30 years, set out to tell the amazing stories of women who are leading their communities in building a healthier place to work and live. They invited other funders on a bus tour, sowing change, to meet the people and see for themselves the organizations that are changing this part of the world day by day. I think the, the most important message to give funders about this tour is the importance of funding grassroots. I think the important thing is the grants if they can be done for multiple years so that these small groups don't have to use all of their time for fundraising and to manage little grants Stuff, but that they know that they're going to be granted for five years, that makes a huge difference because they can hire people and really just stick with it. <laughs> okay. First. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Uh, is that on? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I think, you know, obviously everyone has a personal story that leads them to where we are today. So mine, briefly, was that uh, in the 10 years prior to joining CIR, I basically had my brains beat in uh, <laughs> running big newspapers. And when I left the San Francisco Chronicle, I decided, even though I had some pretty good job offers back on the East Coast, that I wasn't going to go to a newspaper again. And, and what I really wanted to do was... Uh, take all the things I knew and the experiences I had and try and, and be in, a, in an organization or someplace where the creative side, me, was merged with the business plan and, and could really work together rather than sort of being an adversarial relationship based on different value sets. So I didn't realize it, but I became both the business side and the editorial side. So I'm two roles uh, and really in a way it's entrepreneurial and I never framed it that way. So uh, CIR has been around uh, for 32 years. And when I, the board approached me to see if I was interested in becoming the executive director, I said, sure, but I really wanted to change it. Uh, it had to get much bigger. Uh, it had to be much more aggressive. And it had to really be innovative in terms of storytelling, uh, deep storytelling, and take advantage of technology that was just you know, accelerating with change. Uh, and what I wanted to bring to it was a tremendous uh, passion and energy for storytelling uh, and the, the role, especially investigative reporting, has played in our society for a long time. And the board said, fine, I don't think they thought I could do it uh, because I had really no idea. And, and really what this meant for me on a personal level is jumping into a world I had no idea what it was like, which was the foundation funded world. Uh, and as you went around and did your uh, 
presentations, or I did, the first few months with the major foundations in the country, and this would have been in the beginning of 2008, the awareness level of the crisis in journalism was just sort of seeping in. And what I found is that a lot of people were interviewing me because they didn't really believe what was happening. They didn't really understand it. Uh, and what's happened in the 18 months, obviously, is that the issue has exploded, uh, the is issue and the continual shrinkage, I guess, of news organizations and newspapers now going away has, has only been heightened. So it really helped, uh, I think, raise the awareness uh, of the issue. And for CIR, what it's meant is that we are now hiring, uh, one of the few organizations in the country hiring, and we're hiring for a project that's being called California Watch that is mainly funded by Irvine, Hewlett, and Knight, thank you. Uh, and we've been able to raise $3.7 million over three years, and we've had well over 600 applications for eight jobs. And what we're going to do uh, is focus, obviously, on California with deep storytelling. But what we're also going to do is tell stories, I hope, in really innovative ways, working with people like Jerry and others. And the concept's really simple and very complicated. How do you reach audiences in the way they now want to be reached with stories? Whether it's print form, whether it's video, whether it's on the radio, but really create a core team of journalists who are going to be, have skill sets that really meld together and create the content so when it's finished, it goes out in multiple forms. It's a model based on total collaboration internally as well as externally with news organizations. And one of the big other flips that's tipped completely, it's not a tipping point, it's gone, is the willingness by major news organizations to collaborate. As newsrooms are diminished, they need help. And our coin of the realm is the story. We go to an organization with a good story, all of us want a good story, and they respond. Uh, we work regularly like with the LA Times, which was very uh, reluctant probably a year and a half ago to you know, sh work with us individually, but they'd always partner us with a reporter. We've reached a point now where we do stories for them which have a single byline on their front page from one of our staff people. That's partly because they trust us. It's also partly because they have fewer reporters who can work together with us. Uh, CIR also is doing other major projects on, on national and international levels, but again, it's totally based on collaboration. We've gotten money for a project we're trying to get, you know, in those final stages on the civil rights era revolving cold case killings and sort of the linkage of those killings to today, especially in the rural south where a lot of these communities, especially in the black community, it's, it's incredibly painful for the family members and who know so frequently who was involved in killing a relative. And the collaboration we put together for that involved NPR, involved filmmakers, and involved a coalition of black universities, you know, about 30 organizations. And one of the funders who gave us money initially for that, who I met with, actually said, you know why we're giving you this money? And I said, no, I think it's a great story. He says, because we don't, we don't think you can do this. So they, they really wanted to see if we could bring it, the story together, which we've done. It's now teed up for a potential five-part series on, on PBS. I'm not sure that'll happen, but that's where the point we're at with that project. Jerry mentioned passion. She mentioned risk-taking. It's absolutely crucial. Uh, I think if you're still involved in what I'm doing and what all of us are doing and others are doing, and you're still in the journalism game, uh, and a lot of our friends have left and done other things, it's because we understand what we have, but we also have an incredible amount of interest and passion and intensity around it. So I think the people who are doing this really are the true believers. And I think a lot of what I'm doing, to be honest, comes out of, as I said earlier, a tremendous sense of frustration. But we're on the point I've, uh, here in California with this project, I think, of really uh, making a difference and also being a model for everybody else. I'm, the part of the night uh, challenge for us is to not only do the journalism, which they've told me, and I think I agree with we can do, but how do you create sustainability? How do you create a business? How do you create revenue? So we're going to put as much emphasis on the journalism and the storytelling, but also create, I hope, through all kinds of new techniques, social networking. Your idea is a great one, I think, when we have enough sustainability or its content, uh, is to try things that you can't do in a corporate structure. And the major thing of, of the difference for me is to be building something and to believe you can do something without the stress and strain of being in a, in a corporate structure, which is in, in a sense in retreat, and where nearly every decision is influenced at one point by what's that going to do to the bottom line, is really part of the new model as we go forward. 
you know, there has to be a melding between the business side and the journalism side. And I think that's one of the things that's really evolving in these new models, where people are coming in very entrepreneurial. Someone like me needs a huge amount of help from the, on the business development, the branding, the marketing. I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. But we need to bring in people who are going to work with us, who believe in what we're doing, and they're out there, and, and want to help us create the sustainability. We can't simply be dependent on foundations. So as we go forward, we're going to have a totally transparent model and hopefully report to the industry regularly on what works and doesn't work. And one of the best things that the people at night said to me is, uh, you know, fail. We want you to try things. Take risks. This is really about risks. And it's really about also based on all the things we know how to do. So it's not that risky. Uh, and one of the most exciting things for me is meeting the younger generation or people who are maybe even around a little longer who have these multiple skill sets who really need the guidance of somebody like me who's been around but tell stories in ways I couldn't even imagine in terms of where and how it's done. So I think it's an incredibly exciting time, even with all the challenges we face. There's huge opportunities, but I really think one of the key things we all have to think about is take that core story we know how to do based on values, sometimes decades long, and think about how you're going to tell it in ways that are different in terms of the form. I really, you know, for me, the change from not thinking I have a newspaper, but thinking about all these different methods is, is really the biggest change. I just really don't think about a newspaper anymore. I think about all these different ways of storytelling and having a team of people who know how to do that. Uh, so it's, it's very exciting. It's tremendously challenging. It's really not easy. Uh, sometimes a conversation with a foundation ends up and a year later getting the funding. If you have a great idea, well, that is not a lot of fun. But that's why this other challenge in terms of bringing the public and other revenue streams in is really going to be something we're going to explore. So uh, I just think it's, a, it's really an interesting time to do this. And I think there's no sure thing. There's no answer. So it's really about trying lots of different things and see what works. But it's going to be based on quality, our model, and storytelling that's unique and not, you're not going to find somewhere else. Okay. Thank you, Rosie. Um, thank you, and thank you all for being here. Um, well, I'm going, I, I think uh, we're in a very interesting time. It's a time of transition. Uh, transition uh, brings opportunity, and we are all looking for the next model. I think one thing we all agree on is that we are very passionate and believe deeply in quality journalism and the value of it for communities, uh, the value for democracy. Uh, with the shrinkage in news, uh, with the layoffs, and there's less news in communities. Uh, that can bring uh, corruption. That can bring all sorts of, of problems when citizens don't have the, the news and information they need to, to lead informed lives. Uh, because we believe news and information are a core value f uh, for uh, democracy and for citizens. Knight Foundation has been trying to support uh, projects and initiatives that, that try to find the new model. We don't know what the next new model is, but uh, and, and at the same time, we know we can uh, uh, support all the online uh, sites, uh, blogs, and, and investigative reporting. But what, where we can help and what we see or our, our, our role is uh, we can help the new model emerge. So uh, through our different initiatives, we're trying to, to support projects that might be the next model. We, we, we don't know if they're going to work, but uh, we're experimenting. And, and we hope that one of those models work and, and that will be an answer. Uh, the, some of the initiatives, were, I especially work on one initiative called the Night News Challenge. And that's a five-year initiative that will give uh, $5 million a year uh, over, uh, over the five years. And it's a contest that starts uh, every September. And what we're looking for is for projects that meet three criteria. And that's the use of digital media to distribute news and information in local communities. Uh, as uh, Don and, and Jim were talking about, one of the things we are, we look for, because it's very important, it's for replicability, scalability, and sustainability. 
Um, in, in doing that, we, we found that we also asked for open source because that's uh, something that gives, gives it back to, to the community and for others to, to work on it and build on top of it new projects. Uh, one of the, um, through, through the process, we, we've seen six, in three years of the contest, we've seen 6,000 applications. Uh, through them, we've seen trends of, of uh, voids in, in news and information, and we have uh, supported some very interesting projects. Uh, some include the hybrid models, uh, which include the projects like the CIR. Uh, there's also another one, the New England Center for Investigative Reporting, which works uh, with news organizations, a university, and the Center for Investigative Reporting. And the, it's basically a model like, um, like what the um, medicine schools do, uh, where students do the reporting, and they also partner with the news organizations. And so that's one model where there's a lot of partnerships going on. Then there's uh, crowdfunding, which is what, what you're doing. And, and we have a project called Spot.us. Spot and what they do is the, the public and uh, freelancers can pitch uh, stories of him, uh, for investigative reports. And then they crowdfund the story. Uh, people give what they can. And, and, and that's how stories are being funded. Then we have uh, supported niche publications uh, like uh, villagesoup.com. Uh, and through those, uh, they're like, um, new sites that uh, go um, market to very local communities and get local advertisement. Uh, we have worked with other projects like uh, print casting, with each, it's reverse publishing, where uh, people use RSS feeds to create publications and then print them and, and sell local ads. Uh, so we're seeing all these interesting projects and, and experimenting, and, and we hope that one of those projects uh, works. And, and it is very important that, that everyone who's here uh, keeps thinking of new ideas, of new models, and, and, and approach Knight, approach other foundations. If, if we can't fund uh, your idea, we'll try to, to put you in touch with another foundation that can do it or, or put you in contact with somebody in the network who's doing something similar. And the, the other thing is that now that we are doing all these projects, because they are required to be on open source software, uh, we will start releasing that code soon. soon. Uh, so the, the first few projects that are, are, have been built on open source, they will be, uh, start releasing the code this year. So that's uh, a big opportunity because you can use all this free software and, and try to use it in your community as, as, how, as how the project was proposed or think of a new way to use it. So uh, my, my call to action would be to <laughs> please uh, apply. Uh, if, if, you, if you have questions before doing that, uh, you can send me an email or a tweet. And, and one last thing, before uh, tweeting uh, Gangland's uh, username and password, sell it on eBay. Uh, think on the economic model. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <Sure. laughs> ask one question of, of, of all of you before we open it up. Think about, is there one tip that you would give to, to folks in this audience um, if they want to think about being a journalistic entrepreneur or moving toward that model? What, what lessons have you learned? Is there one thing you might suggest that they do? Well, with, with me, it was basically a trial and error situation. I mean, we don't do rocket science. Uh, it became, a, 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 for me, it was, you know, uh, a nuts and bolts issue. Uh, you know, how could I make this work uh, and make it, uh, you know, and continue doing it? I mean, I couldn't keep doing it if I was going to lose money. And it just, uh, it, it was just one, the only way possible. You know, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I believe that at some point in the future, 
uh, people are going to be paying more and more and more for a material that they get online. I mean, newspapers in New York are talking about it, and I think that uh, the time will come when uh, more and more people will be spending money to get things online. The key thing that I found for myself was that if you have a specialty, if you have something that people, you know, uh, that, uh, uh, that you do that other people don't do quite as well or quite as extensively, and it's something that a lot of people or a, even a small group of people are interested in, you can actually market that. And that's basically what I did. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a reporter, like and I said earlier, a newsman or a newspaper man, like everybody, I consider that. And I cover my beat the way any reporter covers any beat by getting as much information from as many different sources as possible to come up with the real story. Uh, uh, but, you know, it be, you know, for me, it just became a, you know, a, an issue of necessity. How could I do it? And when I was faced with that, I just had to come up with some way to make it work or else I had to give it up. Great. What tip would you give to folks who want to uh, apply for one of the challenge grants or think about being entrepreneurial? Um, I think the... the the, one of the main things, and I think we all touch on it, it's uh, really being passionate about, about the project you want to pursue. And I think once you, if, if you really feel passionate about, about what you want to do, uh, you are able to, to propose a great project, to develop a, a great business plan, and, and to move forward. Uh, sometimes we, we see uh, a, a lot of projects that don't really fit into what the, the foundation is supporting, but we see very passionate people behind them. And then it's great to, they are so passionate that it, uh, a year later it's great to find them and see that uh, they found a way to do it because they were passionate and because uh, they truly believe in what they are doing. And, and I think that that's a key element. Yeah, I would echo that. I think, in my experience, you have to really believe in it. Uh, you have to be willing to take risks, and you have to be persistent. And it's uh, it's not a straight line, and, and you have to have some patience. Not probably one of all our virtues. Uh, and you need to bring in people who are much who know things you don't know, and you have to really understand what you don't know. And that, what I mentioned earlier, was sort of the the business piece. I mean, you can be have a great concept, and but where is the business? Or there's things that you're not going to think about. When as journalists, we're really focused on the, the creative side, and, and none of us, I think, or at least in my experience personally, really ever started. You know, we didn't start as journalists to become wealthy or make a lot of money. But what we do has tremendous value, and I think more and more value almost every day because of especially high quality information or credible information. So I really, it's the passion also and the belief. You've got to really want it. I think it's going from prototype, from the idea, the paper, the concept, to creating something real and doing that as, as quickly and as reasonably as possible to, to keep yourself fueled. And that concrete prototype helps you figure out if your ideas were on track and let other people look at it and refine. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to come up with the perfect business plan, the perfect concept, the perfect website to begin with. Just start. Okay, just start. Well, yeah. And you can't be afraid to fail. You can't be afraid to take a chance and make a mistake and go down the tubes and fail. You, you, if it's not worth the risk, it's probably not worth doing. You've got to be willing to lose, fail, and that's basically what all of us have basically said. If you you, you got to be willing to take a chance on it and not be afraid to fail. Okay. That's fine. Well, let's open it up to questions, and if you'd please use, use the microphones, uh, step up and ask any questions you'd like of these folks about their projects or what they're working on. Okay. Carla. Hello, good afternoon. I'm sorry for my English. Uh, who was the great like enemy to fight Sorry. with? Because yeah. some lots of people right think yeah. like, okay, I know how to do stories and how to write stories, but I don't know how to design, how to make a business plan, and uh, just give us a little counselors about, you know, how did you find your? Because I am sure there's there were a lot of people who wanted to help you, but probably there wasn't the the right people 
to suit the, the project you had, then uh, just a counselor or how to find uh, advice, good advice for your project? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, if you, if, I think to be honest, if, if you're a, your, your background is mainly as a reporter, uh, I think what benefited me candidly was the fact that I'd managed a lot. I, I remember one funder who eventually gave us money, and I was talking about multiple things I envisioned doing. He said, how can you manage all that? How can you do that? And I said, well, I, I know it sounds like a lot, but you have to remember, I, I had a newsroom once with 650 people, and it's not me. You bring in other people to help do it, and there's a structure to it. And they immediately understood that. But if it's, that's why I said earlier, if you really have a concept and your background is mainly as a reporter, you need to reach out to people who can help you frame some of these things. Uh, whether it's a friend, I think one of the things I found, and I, I did a hell, mainly I did a lot of reporting, and reporting was me talking to people about what I want to do, but also interviewing them about things. So there's a process where you really have to go through a learning. Uh, and if you have a good idea with a foundation and they like the idea, they're also going to help you get to that place. But we're only talking about foundations. There's a whole other level of potential funding from wealthy donors, individuals who are really interested in journalism and these issues now as well as different models like Spot Us, or how do you get, get the public involved in funding it? So I think there are a lot of different ways to do it. But you need, you have to have the core idea, but you also have to understand you're going to have to reach out, I think, to people who can give you the advice that, you know, in shaping things. And, and uh, you know, that's sort of what we've been doing. Collaboration is really key. Finding partners that will help you do that, even if it's like going to the Small Business Development Center that mo many communities have, and online there are a lot of great resources, and trying to school yourself as much as you can on areas that you don't understand, ask for help. Mm -hmm. Emily. Um, so for Jerry, it was story four. That piece was really moving um, that you yes. showed, and I learned a lot in, oh, what was it, I don't know, 90 seconds or two minutes or something. Um, and it, it was, in essence, you know, it was for funders who were asking people to donate, and I wonder, how do you decide who to work for? Because there's a lot of people you could work for with messages like you might not agree with editorially, or you might. But what kind of guidelines, or how do you make those decisions, like who you will do this for? Um, so far, we've been lucky enough to be able to uh, work for clients that uh, gave us complete editorial freedom about how the piece um, was put together. We collaborate on the structure and the outline and the, the key points and the message. And, you know, we've been fortunate um, to be able to have very healthy collaborative relationships um, with the organizations we've worked with. And it's a selective thing. I, you know, I don't imagine, you know, I'm a little concerned because I know next year a uh, foundation foundations will be hurting and, and their money will be drying up. Um, I, you know, I don't want to work for a company whose message I don't believe in or I don't believe is truthful. You know, it's the st same, my same compass as a journalist is on all the time. I can't turn it off. So it, it works when I'm working. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi, my name is Selena Rodriguez. I'm an 86 fellow here. And the fellowship really changed my life. I got spoiled by California and by the Latino community here. So I decided not to go back home. Home is Mexico, <laughs> Guadalajara. And uh, I did television for the Latino community since 87. I did uh, a news printed media. And uh, three years ago, um, I made my dream come true, which was to do a radio talk show for the Latino community. The Latino media, is, is uh, especially radio, has very poor quality, at least here in the Bay Area. So I decided to start my own radio talk show. And that has been quite an adventure in so many ways. Uh, you were talking about what to do, Carla. I think you mentioned what to do. I'm a journalist. I never had to do anything with sales, of course. As an, I was senior uh, news anchor and reporter. I funded, I started Telemundo, Channel 48 News. I also worked for Channel 14 Univision, then CNN Español in Atlanta, Georgia. Then Telemundo brought me back to the Bay Area, and I said yes, but after three years, I'm going to start my own business. 
And uh, what I did while I was uh, still a news anchor and reporter working for Channel 48 News here in the Bay Area, I took some classes. There are some uh, like um, uh, classes for entrepreneurs. These are nonprofits that was, I paid only $100 for a year and a half that I came to, um, to a foundation here in, in the area. I took a um, weekly class. How to do? How to start your own business? How to do um, financial um, a business uh, uh, plan? And believe me, all those things. How to get your permits? You need to get the permits. All this awful bureaucracy that you have to go through, and then dealing with sales. For me, the hard part has been dealing with sales. You know, uh, getting good salespeople because I'm a journalist and it's been so hard. Well, sales and then journalism. I never. We never mix that. But now we come to uh, times where you are forced to at least to start a sales plan. And that has been the hardest part for me, finding good and responsible people who want to really work hard. They think that they are just come and, and, and are going to come and take advantage of being working for the show. Luckily, and working really, really hard. I never, I've been a workaholic always, but I never knew that I could work so hard uh, after, I mean, during these last three years. I think passion is crucial. I, I'm devoted to what I do. I really have this strong passion inside of me to inform the Latino community with good news. What I mean good news is that I'm not only informing the community about immigration. The Latino community needs to know what is happening in Iran, what is happening in Iraq. I have political experts from Berkeley or, or San Jose State who explain us what is happening. And I tell the audience, if you are, we're going to talk about, let's say, um, well, Honduras, of course, what is happening now, and what are the, the roots uh, underneath why they came to this situation, even though it's Latin America, but it's amazing how little sometimes we know about our own countries. So I just wanted to share this. I really need um, guidance. I may talk to you, Jose, after uh, we're done, and, and uh, to you guys, because believe me, it has been quite an adventure. I'm not going to give up, and uh, the show has gain a lot of uh, respect from the audience. Being on television really helped me all these years. But it's worth to try. I mean, if you don't try, and if we die without trying, <laughs> we're not a good journalist. So thank you so much, guys. Great, thank you. <laughs> so uh, let me put one of my friends on the spot here, I suppose. Jerry has, it's about business models and about distribution. So Jerry has a business model that's about a paywall and a, and a walled garden and people pay for content. And Jerry basically has a service model, which is I find people who need help having stories told and I help them do that. I understand those. Rosie, it's wonderful that the LA Times or the Washington Post or AP now will distribute your work and they, uh, or ProPublica's work. But doesn't that now give incentive to the LA Times or the Washington Post to lay off more investigative reporters? And what are we going to do about that going down the road? Well, I don't, I don't think uh, the LA Times, we, we do get paid for some of the stories, not obviously what they'd pay a staffer. Uh, I guess one of the challenges we all face, and I sort of alluded to here, is that I don't think CIR or ProPublica are threats to the, uh, the newsrooms of those papers. Um, I think that the, one of the challenges we face is, is this, and it goes to a question about funding also, which is a much broader discussion, is a, and it's one I debate. If the stories aren't being done, you know, you need someone to do them. So I think there's this huge vacuum and void, and I don't think we're a threat, and I've never thought of it that way. I think the bigger challenge for us is going to be how to create a business model. And I think in the heyday of newspapers in this country, you had multiple brands and multiple strong news organizations in every metro market that did a lot of this work. Uh, and they were, in a sense, competing, but you really had a, a core of journalists. Uh, and I think what I'm, I'm seeing, and I think what's going to happen in the next few years is organizations like CIR or others uh, around the country are really going to start sprouting up, and they have started sprouting up. 
and, and it's going to supplant in some ways these other models. And the need really is for the work. So I don't think, I've never thought for a second I was going to undermine any reporters in any of these news organizations. Uh, I mean, if we're really successful, I think we'll, what models like ours will be able to do, and a and goal I have is to be able to hire people. One of my biggest frustrations since I started is the number of really talented people who have come to me with great stories who we just couldn't find funding for and support for. Uh, and that's been probably a frustration. So again, I think it's going to be you know, a model uh, that's going to really evolve. And hopefully, there'll be more and more organizations that are either nonprofit or funded in different ways. And there's something called an LC3, which is a for-profit potential wing of a nonprofit that sort of fuels it. Uh, so again, that's a whole other discussion about some of the other things people are thinking about. But it's evolving. So I don't feel guilty about anybody losing their job because of CIR. Hey. Yeah, so Michael and I are in the same class. We're in the same class, so my question follows up his. So I was thinking if I were Karl Marx, how I'd look at what's happening. And I would say, how, how could the capitalists or the corporations have abandoned something that's so important to them and sort of handed it over to, handed it out to chaos? And what, and, and you know, have, have they thought about what they've done, destroying the way in which they, I mean, for example, we saw the first half or two thirds of the Bush administration in which the press is, I think many of us, I would, have, I would think just didn't do its job at all. Didn't do its job about the coming, about the financial crash we're living through. And so why did they walk? I don't get it. Why did they walk? I don't want to, I'll jump in. They walk on the thing that was the source of their power for so long. Well, I don't think, uh, I, uh, well, I had a front row seat. I mean, uh, I was the editor of the biggest paper, Knight Ritter. So I had a lot of uh, conversations with the corporate people. And I, I don't think they walked. I think you really had a total clash in values. And as much as people love to run a newspaper company, and I'm talking about my own experience, and love the imprimatur and the prestige and the value, there was a f the core value and the core drive was profit. And it was a, I can't, I mean, I literally had people get really excited that uh, when we were having buyouts that somebody who'd won two Pulitzer Prizes or one Pulitzer Prize was going to take it and uh, because it was a higher amount of dollars that would fall to the bottom line as an FTE. It was maybe twice the rate of a normal thing. So I, I said it earlier. I think it was just a clo total clash in values. Uh, and I think that when your core value is to sit to the shareholder rather than public service, you run in conflict. And that's why I said earlier also, I think the new models really have to have straight from the very beginning, what is our mission? Not only in terms of sustainability, but our role in terms of service. And I think we are in this transformational, transitional time where this is going to get shaken out. I mean, I'd love to uh, be making enough money to hire more people, but you know, we're in this transition. So I, you know, I'm not casting judgment on any one organization, but that's what I saw. Uh, and that it was very, very difficult when people who were core, sometimes accountants, uh, that was their measure of success. And the family held newspapers have different challenges now and different issues, and, and we see what's happening there. But the model was you know, based on accelerating profits quarter by quarter by quarter by quarter. And that eventually came into conflict with the people who did the work in terms of you know, the cost structure and how you sustain that. And that you know, just it flipped, and it flipped very quickly. I mean, it's astonishing what's happened in 10 years, if you think about it historically. And I think the, you know, the history is, who knows what's going to look like in 30 or 40 years, 50 years from now, or tw 10 years, or three years. But there are things happening that uh, are going to really accelerate and take off. Andrea. In, in our newsroom, we've done. Um, Get near the microphone, yeah. In our newsroom, we've done a lot of work with ProPublica. And um, I would say overall, it's been really great. I would say there have been some unexpected challenges to collaborating, which um, none of us really thought about. We were like, oh, great, let's do a story. But you know, sort of different newsrooms have different cultures. And then plus, you've got you know, this issue of 
you have to get everybody bought in and every organization. So you sort of increase the layers of, of people that have to get behind it and people have different visions. And I'm just sort of wondering how you have worked out some of those challenges and uh, give you some tips on uh, how, to, how to sort of move forward is when you bring sort of you know, two newsrooms together in a sometimes what feels like a shotgun marriage and sometimes feels like you know, marriage of love. You're asking me? I, yeah. OK. Uh, well, I also ran something called the Chauncey Bailey Project, which was tremendously successful in terms of, uh, thank you. But in that, I can tell you, the first meetings that they asked me to come in on were complete disasters. Uh, and, and I was an com outsider with multiple news organizations. Collaboration is very hard. You're absolutely right. And you have to come in and get an agreement that you all want to do the story first. If it's a story you all believe in and share, then a lot of the stuff gets cleared out. But you know, our model is going to be based on collaboration. And we don't have the ability to do every element. And part of it is thinking of different platforms. If we par partner with KQED, they're going to, they have the expertise in radio. We bring them a story. The reporters work together. But I'm not going to tell them how to do the radio story. Same thing with a TV station. But I think the key thing is, number one, setting up a structure and having somebody in charge, because you have to have a referee. And you have to arrange all these things ahead of time. You also have to understand there are going to be compromises. If you have multiple medium and media, you have TV stations and a radio station and a print partner, who gets it first? Well, with the Chauncey Bailey Project, we decided it goes on everybody's website simultaneously, even though if the first broadcast might be a TV station at 10 o'clock. And then you're all sort of marketing to each other. So if the Oakland Tribune had it on their front page the next morning, they were OK with that. It was compromises. But if the goal is, in the Chauncey Bailey Project's case, to, to get something straightened out and have impact, think about in the Bay Area, when those stories ran, we were on t in TV, multiple TV stations, radio stations, multiple newspapers, weeklies radio talk shows, I mean, it really saturated the market and had an impact. So from everybody's point of view, if that was the goal, you had, it worked. I mean, with investigative reporting, our niche, it's impact. You want to force change or create public awareness. So I think, again, I think you really have to have a shared value when you start. You know, we were a bunch of us uh, nonprofits were at Pocantico in, in New York um, last week. I think it was last week. And, uh, we, you know, we, I'm not going to get into that, but I mean, a, there's a shared goal here, and I think that's the crucial thing. Uh, and some news organizations are going to be very reluctant. Uh, you know, do they trust you? Is your quality as strong as theirs? Is yours reporter? But these are all hurdles, I think, that are going to be overcome again as we go forward. This is going to be a new model, whether it's through distribution or teams of reporters from different places working together and elevating uh, the impact and the eyeballs on a story. One last question. Yeah. This is for Jerry and Robert. And I'd like to ask how you deal with the sometimes blurry line between advocacy and journalism when you're working with foundations that have their own agendas. Uh, I worked for CIR in the 1980s in the Washington, D.C. office. And this may still be true, I don't know. But at the time, we had a lot of foundation support from uh, organizations that promoted things like environmental protection. When we applied for press credentials at the US Senate, there was a great controversy over whether our staff members were journalists or advocates. And we finally prevailed in that by saying, look at our work, see what we do. We're journalists, we're not advocates. But that was always, there's, it seems to me that there's always this suspicion when you are getting funding from foundations that do have agendas that they're promoting, that your stories are somehow tainted. You want to go first? Yeah. I, I think it has to do with the process and the product. And that's how you weigh any piece of information that you're taking in. You know, is it, does it walk like a duck? Is it a duck? Is it a commercial? Or is it a, you know, is it presenting information and challenging me to think about something in a different way? Is it framing an issue? And, you know, I, I think as these lines blur, that's going to be the ultimate, the, the ultimate um, place the decision is made, because it's going to be impossible to track 
or more difficult to track who's funding what, where things are, where things are originating. And so those bright lines that we've drawn are going to be harder to find. And so we've got to find a new way to decide, do you believe this? Is it, is it honest? Is it truthful? Is it balanced? Is it fair? If, if we were advocates, I think we would have been able to raise more money. And we're not. We don't want to be seen that way. And I think there's no question that uh, people have approached. I've literally you know, had phone calls from people who want to know if we do X or Y and offer a lot of money, individuals, uh, you know, to really go after one thing or another. And you know, we say no. Uh, but it is the perception of conflict you know, is rife. And I think it's a judgment call uh, based on uh, how strong an advocate the foundation is, and if they're clearly campaigning. Louis Freeberg, who's back here, was a nice fellow who's the director of the California Watch Project. And I just had a series of debates internally and conversations with a funder who we said no to for the possibility of getting a lot of money uh, because of some issues with what their role may or may not be. Uh, so sometimes you have to turn down money, which is very, or the potential for money. Uh, and support because of that. But it's, it's again, going forward, I think this is a, you know, it's a, the ground is shifting. And I think we're in a place now where if you can't do the work and because you don't have the financial support, is there going to be new models, new rules, and explanations for going forward? Uh, newspapers and other media obviously have relied on advertising from all kinds of people in their you know, business side that, you know, the public saw it one way or the other. But I think, you know, again, we're in a new terrain here. And, I think there will be lots of conversations about do you take the money, do you, can you do the work, or you just don't do it. Uh, so I think you know, it's all going to be shifting around, but it is an issue that's going to continue to be there. And the best thing we can do is be really transparent about the source of funding. And especially with investigative reporting, whatever you do, you know you're going to take a lot of uh, challenge and grief, push back, worse. Comes with the territory. Thank you, Jerry, Robert, Jose, and Jerry. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.